Hey everyone, welcome to The Wildlife, a documentary series about the animals we share our planet with. I'm your host, Kevin, and today we're going to be talking about our first audience-selected species, Canis lupus, the gray wolf. Okay, so this is part two of this episode, so if you haven't watched part one yet, go watch that half first so you're up to speed on everything we've discussed thus far. Okay, let's dive in. Gray wolves are Animalia cordata, Mammalia carnivora, Canidae canis lupus, or just canis lupus for short. They are the largest, most gregarious extant species in the genus Canis, and they were once the most wide-ranging wild terrestrial animals in the northern hemisphere. But today, Canis lupus inhabits less than two-thirds of its historic range. Canis lupus is at once one of the most fascinating and arresting creatures representing the wild known to all of human culture and civilization, and one of the most controversial animals humans have ever encountered. Ecologically, Canis lupus is an apex predator at the top trophic level of the ecosystems in which it is found, and fulfills a critical role in those ecosystems by controlling prey populations through predation and behavior modification. This is their role in a trophic cascade. So what is a trophic cascade? Well, a trophic cascade is an ecological model where one trophic level of a food chain controls or modifies another, and thus the one adjacent to it, and so on. The simplest example of a trophic cascade is the presence of an apex predator in an ecosystem, controlling an herbivore population, thereby reducing the pressure the herbivore population places on producers, plants, in the ecosystem, and allowing them to thrive. In any ecosystem, balance is the ultimate arbiter of success. A system with too many predators will overpredate the consumer population, which in turn will reduce the food supply for the predator population and allow for the producer population, again plants, to overpopulate and become overabundant. Similarly, a population with too few predators or no predators will have too many consumers, which will place too much pressure on producers and can lead to a reduction of forested acreage, among other negative effects. Naturally, the question follows, do gray wolves actually cause trophic cascades in their ecosystems? The short answer is yes. However, there is a far more complicated explanation to back up that succinct yes than many outside the scientific community have probably heard. Ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, it may be more appropriate to say that gray wolves contribute to trophic cascades in many ecosystems where they have been reintroduced and where they are present. Most people first heard the term trophic cascade a few years ago with the viral popularity of a 2014 sustainable human video, How Wolves Change Rivers, which while exciting and engaging, left out some stuff. Sustainable Human does a good job of summarizing a top-down trophic cascade and the implications for other mesopredators in the Yellowstone ecosystem. But they make a few editorial decisions that omits critical information about the ecosystem that scientists like David Meech and Doug Smith, who is the project leader for the Yellowstone Gray Wolf Re Restoration Project in Yellowstone, would disagree with. Smith is quoted in an interview with David Meech in International Wolf Magazine as saying, The danger we perceive is that all changes to the system, now and in the future, will be attributed solely to the restoration of the wolf. See, we humans like to have a tidy cause and effect relationship for things. This begets that. But that's simply not how nature works in most cases. What the popular video doesn't take into account in its summary is a confluence of events, including the increase of growing season for aspens since 1995 of about 27 days, 
which could have contributed to the taller aspen recordings in the study, the effects of drought on the park ecosystem, and bison-borne brucellosis, which can spread to elk. All of these factors may have contributed to the effects being attributed to the wolf reintroduction, which stabilized the course of the Yellowstone River. But without a more detailed study, it's impossible to know and equally impossible to attribute the cause or causes to a sole factor. Conversely, Meech indicates that there is good evidence in Banff National Park in Canada where Canis lupus has caused a terrific cascade, resulting in a reduction in elk numbers, which has released willow and thus seen an increase in songbird species that depend on the willow. While not as dramatic and exciting as the Yellowstone story, it's more conclusive. Globally speaking, according to the IUCN, the gray wolf, quote, does not meet or nearly meet any of the criteria for threatened categories, end quote, because it exists in such numbers as to be considered stable. However, at a regional level, several wolf populations, such as those in Europe, are seriously threatened. In the United States, for example, because of localized extirpation, gray wolves are protected under the Endangered Species Act of 1973 in some states. But it's complicated because of political lobbying and subterfuge. I'm just going to let that one hang for a bit. Yeah. Okay, so... I would argue that the greatest conservation challenge facing Canis lupus is the human attitude towards the species. As stated in the introduction, wolves in general are some of the most controversial animals humanity has ever encountered. At once a symbol of the wilderness, loyalty, and freedom, Canis lupus is also seen as an archetypal omen of evil, symbol of villainy, and stand-in for unknown ills and destruction. From Narnia to Fantastica, wolves are harbingers and heralds of doom. And these historical attitudes and paranoias continue to color our perceptions of Canis lupus today. In fact, human conflicts with gray wolves are often human-instigated, while the perception of them is the reverse but the data just doesn't support our supposition of gray wolves as aggressive and evil creatures. So one's left asking, why do we have this perception? And why do we cling to it? More technically, we can point to human encroachment on wild lands and things like deforestation, agriculture development, infrastructure development, free range livestock on public lands, and active hunting of wolves as threats to conservation of the species. But politically and ethically, I think, and this is just my opinion, it is the pervasive attitude towards Canis lupus as a threat to humans that underrides all of these actions and efforts of wolf extermination and extirpation. From our stories to the modern day lobbying efforts backed by Big Ag, the pervasive belief that gray wolves are evil, violent, aggressive, and ferocious killers, threats to human survivability and prosperity, and must be wiped out, has driven our collective, obsessive, ongoing conflict with this species. Luckily for the wolf, and for us, there's some movement on that front, as Boitani, Paquette, and Masani write in their book, The World of Wolves, New Perspectives on Ecology, Behavior, and Management, quote, Wolves have only been recognized as valuable ecosystem components by ecologists and the general public in the last part of the 20th century. Subsequently, governments and other interest groups have promoted initiatives to help wolf recovery and recolonization, or to reintroduce wolves in areas where they had been previously extirpated. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show and that you learned something fun and interesting about the gray wolf, Canis lupus. Patrons and Sterable members, 
Don't forget to please tune in to the bonus episode for even more Grey Wolf content I wasn't able to fit in here. Check out the references in the description and some suggested reading for those of you hungry to learn more. Articles from JSTOR can be accessed through your local library, so make sure you've got your membership card. I've also shared some links to Grey Wolf conservation efforts and research programs if you're interested in ways to support these essential apex predators in the wild and grow our understanding of their roles in the ecosystem. If you like this and other episodes of The Wildlife, please consider supporting the show through Patreon or Starable. An episode like this one costs almost $400 to produce, and every bit of your support helps bring new content to the audience of explorers and learners. Please share with your friends and family, teachers and professors. Let's build a community together. Until next time, stay wild.